Let's jump into his word, can we? Can we? Grab your Bibles. And turn with me, if you will, to two passages of Scripture that will drive our conversation today. Numbers chapter 13, verses 26 through 33. Second Corinthians chapter five verses nineteen and twenty. Yeah, I'm gonna preach to y'all nine people. Today we're shifting gears as we close this series out. I need you to grab hold of this. We're shifting gears in such a way that the composition of our conversation is going to be a little different because what we've been focusing on for the last several weeks is the power of the blank in our lives, the I am to blank. We've been talking about how to deal with the blank in a biblical yet relevant way. The I'm too tired, the I'm too worn, the I'm too messed up, the I'm too broken, the I'm too fearful, the I'm too hurt, the I'm too angry, the I'm too divorced. That place, that space, that piece of real estate in our minds has begun to control the dynamics and the disposition of our lives. We've given that place so much power that we've lost focus of who Jesus is because we're more focused on what is wrong in our lives, what's in the blank, that we've lost perspective that Jesus died on the cross so that we would overcome the label that's been placed upon us, whether we did it or whether someone else did it. We've become so keenly aware of the power of the blank that we've lost the power of the cross. And so what's in the blank has begun to define our lives. It's become the excuse for our lives. It's the I'm too depressed becomes the excuse that we use for underperforming in so many areas of our lives. The I'm too broken or the I'm too hurt becomes the excuse that we use for the lack of trust in our relationships. And therefore, what's in the blank has become the explanation for the status of our lives. But today I want to shift gears. Rather than talking about what's in the blank, rather than talking about what someone else, maybe yourself or someone else has placed upon you, I don't want to talk about what you've placed in the blank or someone else has placed in the blank, but rather I want to talk about what God says should be in that blank. More specifically, I want to look at how the word defines who we are rather than how the world defines who we are. Can I get some help in this place today? So look at your neighbor and announce to them the subject matter of our conversation. Drop what's in the blank. Look at your other neighbor and say, drop what's in the blank. Mm. Somebody say, do the drop. Drop it like it's, never mind. Don't do that. <laughs> you can be seated. Some of y'all, oh no, he's dead. Today I want to take you to two passages of scripture that I believe will highlight a place that we can all relate to. First, I want to take you to Numbers chapter 13. Read the verses 26 through 33. Not really offer any commentary, but extract out of those verses what God is trying to show us today. Something that I believe we in so many ways relate to. Here's what he says in verse 26. He says, they came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Jeb. The Hittites live in the Jebusites, and the Amorites live in the hill, and the Cellulites are all around. Notice I said all around. I was just seeing if y'all were paying attention. Some of y'all, listen, there's no cellulites here. I'm just, just saying. 
Verse 30, it says, Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they had explored. They said, The land we explored devours those who are living in it. All of the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. Look at your neighbor and say, are you a grasshopper? Uh -huh. What's happening in this passage of Scripture is 500 years of people talking about a promise that God had given is now standing within a stone's throw of their possession. Here they have the ability to walk into what God has for them, but yet they cannot walk into what God has for them because what they see seems to be so impossible because of how they view themselves. We're grasshoppers. What God has promised to them is there for the taking, but yet they cannot walk into what they see because now the promise doesn't seem so much like a promise, but rather it seems like an impossibility, all because they see themselves as a grasshopper. And because they see themselves as a grasshopper, and they also think others see them as the grasshopper, they cannot take possession because they're not willing to fight through what's in the blank. I'm too small, I'm too inferior, I'm too incapable. They're of great size and we are not. And therefore, the very promise that God has said that they would possess for 500 years is no longer going to be within their possession because they've allowed some opposition that seems to be bigger than them to keep them out of what God had ordained for them to have. Therefore, the enemy that we see in this passage of Scripture is not the giants. The enemy that we see in this passage of Scripture is themselves. Their opposition is not the giant, Richie. Their opposition is themselves. So last week we were closing out the message and I read to you an excerpt out of this book that when I read this excerpt, I really felt like the wind, the air in the room, if you will, just kind of left. I heard people go, <sighs> at the very end of my message, I read this excerpt and I felt like it was so applicable then. And while I was reading it, I felt in my spirit, the Holy Spirit say, I'm not done with this thought, this concept. And so that's really how today was birthed. And so I want to read to you again this thought that's in this book so that maybe it will bring back a, a, a thought for you. Maybe it will refresh your memory. Maybe you were not here and you need to hear it. But here's what happened. It says this. It said, uh, the company Dove released a video campaign that has been viewed over 67 million times on YouTube and proves this point. They ask participants to come into a room one at a time and describe themselves to a sketch artist. The artist could not see them. He only drew what they described. After the artist had finished, another person came into the room and was asked to, to describe the same person who had just left the room. Again, the artist sketched the person based only on the descriptions given, and when he finished, they brought the subject back into the room and showed her both pictures, one described by herself and the other described by a stranger who, who she had just met. In every instance, it says, in every instance, the picture described by the stranger was much more beautiful and positive than the picture des described by the subject. The point of the video is that all of us are harder on ourselves than we should be. We all view ourselves worse than we really are. Wow, that is exactly where the people of Israel are in Numbers chapter 13. We're grasshoppers and they're giants. They see themselves as grasshoppers and because they see themselves as grasshoppers, they just think that somebody else sees them the same way. The opposition in their lives is not the giant. The opposition in, the, in their lives is themselves. But can I tell you something? I need you to hear this. The opposition in your life does not determine the power that you have access to. 
Would you grab that? The opposition in your life does not determine the power that you have access to. They said, they're giants and we're grasshoppers and they see us the same way. Now, when I read that passage of scripture, I, I, I think to myself, hold on, you were spies. You went into the land unannounced. How do you know what the giants think about you? Did you walk up to a giant and say, Mr. Giant, sir, I'm a grasshopper. What do you think? No. So how do you know what they think about you? You see, how we see things in life determines how we respond to what we see. But what if, what if we changed what was in the blank? We're so overwhelmed with what we think of ourselves and therefore we think others must think of the same thing, think of us the same way. But what if we exerted as much energy by changing what was in the blank and exerted as much energy thinking about, focusing on and concentrating on how God feels about us? Lord have mercy. How would our lives change? That's where 2 Corinthians comes into play. Turn with me there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. Here's what Paul says. Paul is writing to the early Christ follower at the church at Corinth. The people in this church are a, really a dejected group of people because they're overwhelmed by circumstances in their lives what's happening around them, and because of what's happening around them, they've lost the focus of the power that resides within them, so they're not able to change what's happening around them, and therefore they, they feel oppressed and discouraged and defeated. I am too this, I am too little of that, I am inferior, I am fearful. What's in the blank has begun to overwhelm their life. So Paul addresses it by telling them that they need to drop what's in the blank. <laughs> and put something else in the blank. Here's what he says. He says in verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us, this is where it's good, he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Hold on, here's Paul talking to the early Christ follower, also to us, telling us that we have a responsibility of reconciling men and women to the goodness and graciousness of God. We have a responsibility of being involved in the process or the promise of reconciliation. Hang on a second. If you really begin to think about the promise of reconciliation and how God sent his only son Jesus to die on a cross in order to reconcile us, in order to bridge the gap, between heaven and earth in order to give us the opportunity to have everlasting life. Now Paul is saying that we have a responsibility in that. Here lies the problem. So many times we are focused on what we've placed in the blank and because what we've placed in the blank, we, we lose focus of what God has told us our responsibility is. We're so focused on and distracted by our condition that we've, lose, we've lost sight of our mission. He said that we have a responsibility. All 3,000 promises in God's word, God so chooses to fulfill those promises through us. We have a responsibility, he's saying. That's your responsibility. That's your job description. So then he goes to something else here. He begins to elevate the pressure. He begins to go to a whole nother level because he says this in verse 20. He says, we are therefore, now that you know what your job description is, he says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. It says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. Lord have mercy. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, I'm an ambassador. Hold on for a second. He's saying, drop what's in the blank. Guys, you've been looking at yourself in a defeated state. Drop what's in the blank because we are ambassadors. Stop worrying about what others think about you. Stop being so, so predisposed to what you think about yourself. Stop worrying about all of those things and begin to see yourself as, as an ambassador because that is how Christ, that is how God, that is how heaven is empowering you as an ambassador. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, I'm an ambassador. 
Look at your other neighbor and say, drop what's in the blank. Can, can I teach for a minute? Because I believe some of you did not realize that you hold a highly esteemed, a celebratory, a very important position in the kingdom of God. You're an ambassador. You see, when Paul used this term ambassador in the Greek, he used a Greek word presbuo. The Greek word presbuo means to fulfill the role of an ambassador. It means to take the high position of the ambassador and fulfill its governmental role. I thought, well, hold on a second. Exactly what does that mean? Paul, what did you mean? So I began to look up some descriptions and definitions of an ambassador. Can I share those with you? Here's the very first thing that you need to see. Number one, an ambassador is an envoy sent to represent a nation to a foreign land. Hold on a second. That a preach. Let me say it again. It says an ambassador is an envoy sent to represent a nation to a foreign land. In other words, <laughs> we're representing heaven. In the land that we're planted in come on somebody help me number two it says an ambassador is a diplomatic agent of the highest rank some of y'all just got a promotion number three this is good it says an ambassador is an authorized agent or messenger who has the power to make decisions and to represent the will of a nation or the king that he represents oh this is getting good Number four, watch this, it says, an ambassador is a person who is authorized to speak on behalf of his sender. Oh, hold on a second, who sent us? God himself, let me say that again, it says, an ambassador is a, is a person who is authorized to speak on behalf of his sender. So, so hold on for a second, that just means that you are so important to the kingdom of God that all of heaven is standing ready, waiting to empower you, to help you, to assist you, to cause you to be able to overcome what is coming against you, so that when you begin to act in faith, all of heaven's resources rain down in your life, you're not hearing this that just means that heaven is standing there waiting you are fulfilling what God has called you to do every time you step and realize that you are an ambassador he is funding you he is facilitating you he is empowering you he is protecting you why because every resource that heaven has is at your disposal why because I'm an ambassador somebody needs to look at your neighbor and say are you an ambassador because I am Say ambassador. But some of you still are not getting this. And the reason why you're not getting it is because you haven't taken the eraser out and erased what's in the blank. And the reason why you haven't erased what's in the blank is because you just don't fully understand how you could be an ambassador. Because you're so focused on what's been in the blank for years. I'm too small. They're too large. I'm incapable. I'm too messed up. I, I, I'm too this. I'm too divorced. I'm too old. I'm too fearful. I'm too broken. I, I, I'm too this. I'm too that. And so I feel unworthy to be able to walk in that, in that mantle, if you, feel, if, if you will. I feel unworthy to be able to walk the way God is calling me to walk as an ambassador. I feel unqualified. I feel like my life has disqualified me. But let me tell you something. Somebody's about to be set free in this place because you need to understand that God does not call the qualified but rather he qualifies those whom he calls. Did you hear me? He qualifies those whom he calls. So you might have seen yourself as a grasshopper. You might have seen yourself as too little, as too unworthy, as too messed up, as too this or too that. But God looks for those whom at one point in time had something in the blank that made them feel unworthy. So that when he takes out of the blank what was in the blank and replaces the blank with ambassador, that way no one can take credit for what God's about to do in your life no one can put their fingerprint on you and say the reason why they're a success is because of me the reason why they're a success is because they're lucky no God will plant you in the land of giants just to use you as an emissary from heaven because he wants to rain down the resources of heaven in your life some of you right now say well I don't have what I need well if you don't have it God says you don't need it good God Almighty somebody ought to praise him up in here some of you are like, well, you know, God, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I can do that. Listen, you're not doing it in your own power. You're an ambassador sent by God. 
And you're telling yourself that I am not. And God is saying you are everything I've created you to be. Here lies the problem. We can research these two passages of scripture. And we find this common thread. The problem is not that we don't know who God is and what he's capable of. The problem is that we don't know who we are in God and what that makes us capable of. Because we're focused on being the grasshopper. Overlooked, undervalued, I'm too unappreciated. Can I tell you something? If you do not realize who you are in Christ, you will always focus on your deficiencies rather than your destiny. Good Lord have mercy. I, I need some help from this crowd. If, if, if you don't realize who you are in Christ, you will always focus on your deficiencies rather than your destiny. Let me read you something. I, I'm, I'm going to show you something. In the message translation, I want to read to you, if I can find it. How many of you know that God's phone will find it? It's only the God phone because it's an Apple phone. It's not because it's my phone, y'all. Come on. Okay, okay, here we go. I'm going to read something to you. It, in the message translation, you've got to see how Eugene Peterson, he translates this in such a poetic way. I'm going to reach down somewhere into that verse of Scripture because it's broken up in verses 16 through 20. So let me just start somewhere. It says, now we look inside and what we see is that anyone united with the messiah gets a fresh start he's created new hold on a second all who believe in him old things pass away and he becomes a new creation and he goes on to say the old life is gone a new life burgeons look at it all this comes from the god who settled the relationship between us and him and then called us to settle our relationships with each other hello huh god put the world square with himself through the messiah mm. giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins, God has given us the task of telling everyone what he is doing. That's our job description. He's given us the task of reconciling men unto him. But then watch this. It says, we're Christ's representatives. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and enter into God's work of making things right between them. We're speaking for Christ himself now. Become friends with God because he's already a friend with you. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Hold on a second. It says, we're Christ's representatives. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences. Somebody say, drop your differences. Can I ask you a question? Think about this in terms of the dynamics of culture today. How do we cause men and women to drop their differences and see a gracious God if we do not see ourselves as an ambassador of Christ? How do we cause people to drop their differences if we don't drop what's in the blank? We cannot cause people to be reconciled unto God and to drop their differences. Everybody say drop. Until we begin to see ourselves in, as ambassadors. So here's the deal. Over the last several weeks, I've given to you our main points with certain letters. They all begin with a certain letter, like week one. It all began, all of our main points began with the letter D. Week two, all of our points began with the letter R. Week three, all of our points began with the letter P. Today, all of our points begin with the letter O. Can I give you those points? The very first thing that you need to do if you want to change what's in the blank is you've got to take ownership. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, I'm an owner. I'm going to own who Christ says I am. I'm going to take ownership of who Christ says I am. Ownership. Let me show you something. In Numbers chapter 13, 
verse 30. Let me read this to you. It says, Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. Sounds like an owner. God gave us the promise. <laughs> we're going to take it. We can certainly do it. He gave it to us. It's ours for the taking. They're in our land, and we're going to kick them out of our land. It's like somebody living up in your house. You're like, no, you ain't living up in my house. It's mine. I own it. But then in verse 31, something strange. The conversation shifts. Verse 31, it says, But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. We can't. We can't. We're grasshoppers. Have you lost your mind? They're giants. We're grasshoppers. We can't. We can't go up there. We can't do this. We can't. Why? Because we're focused on what we can't do. Why? Because we're focused upon the blank. And what's in the blank is that I am too small. I am incapable. I am insecure. I have too, much, too, too many fears. We're grasshoppers. The problem is most of us, many of us, I should say, reduce our lives to that of an insect that could be squished at any moment. By that, I mean because of what we see and how we see ourselves, it controls the dynamic of how we function. He says, we can't do this because they're too large and we're too small. We're, we're grasshoppers. And sometimes we find ourselves in that same position. We're grasshoppers. But then we pray, God bless us. Can I tell you something? God will not bless the fake you. Hello, let that sink in. Some of you are living like a grasshopper when he called you to live like an ambassador and you're asking him to bless you. He's not going to bless the fake you. All of heaven's resources are not open for the crickets and for the grasshoppers, but rather for you as an ambassador. Hello. So they say, we can't, we can't do this, we can't, we, we, we can't, we, 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 we can't. <laughs> and then we can't gives way to, we don't have. We don't have what they have. We don't have the resources that they have. We don't have the large fortified cities. We don't have the giants. We, we don't have any of those things. And then pretty soon, we don't have gives way to its partner, I will never be. I will never get out of this. I will never overcome this. I will never be what I thought I would be. I, 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 we will never have what we thought we would have. Somebody's about to be set free right here, right now. Because do you know why there was such a, a dynamic issue here? The reason why there was such an issue here, if you research what was happening, the people of Israel, the 12 spies, were now beginning to look at what was happening in the land that was promised to them and all of these large fortified cities. And now they were comparing themselves who had lived in the desert now for a, a little bit of time, now seeing that they had just come out of slavery, still seeing themselves as slaves. So therefore they're seeing all of this stuff that seems to be so much bigger and better than them. So now they've reduced themselves to a grasshopper and we can't do what you're asking us to do. Do you realize what's happening here? They're living their lives based upon the storyline that someone else's life is written to. They're living by a false narrative. Hold on a second. When you begin to evaluate your life so many times, what happens in our lives is that we live by someone else's storyline. You see, God didn't call them to be bigger than the giants. God didn't even call them to be stronger than the giants. God called them to trust in him that's what he asked them to do. Galatians chapter 6, verse 4, it says in a, in a paraphrased way, it says to stop comparing yourself to others so that you can do the job that you're to do. Mm. Something that I've noticed about the comparison thing is it never works in reverse. We're always comparing what we don't have to what it seems like somebody else has. We're always comparing, you know, our life seems to be so bad and theirs is so good. It never works in reverse. It's never like our lives are so good and theirs are so bad. We need some bad in our lives. Give me some of what they have. It never seems to work that way. The point that I am trying to make to you is just because God has called you to be an ambassador does not mean that life is going to be roses and bonbons. 
But sometimes God is going to plant you in the land of the giants so that you will be an emissary for the heaven, for the kingdom of God, so that all of heaven's resources will rain down in your midst. The point that I am trying to make is that some of you need to thank God for the journey that you are on. Because sometimes you are in, sometimes you are out. Sometimes you are up, sometimes you are down. Sometimes you, you have directions, but sometimes you are absolutely confused and you do not know where to go. The point that I am trying to make is that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. Your are still not hearing me. Some of you need to begin to praise God because everything in your life has a purpose. That up has a purpose. That down has a purpose. That valley has a purpose as an ambassador. That mountaintop has a purpose as an ambassador. That relationship has a purpose as an ambassador. That high point, that low point, that pain has a purpose as an ambassador. Your job has a purpose as an ambassador. Your neighborhood has a purpose as an ambassador so that you can begin to live the life God called you to live as an emissary representing heaven so that all all of heaven will rain down. Some of you need to tell the enemy, you will not win. I am not a grasshopper. I am not. I am a child of God. I am victorious. I am blessed. I am highly favored. I'm a holy nation, a peculiar people, a special possession of God who called me out of darkness into his marvelous light. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, drop what's in the blank because I'm walking out. I'm walking out of darkness. I'm walking out of depression. I'm going out because I'm an ambassador. Somebody say, I'm an owner. The second O is opposition. Opposition. Some of you are worried about the opposition entirely too much. All you do is think about the opposition. The opposition could be anything that places a limitation upon you. The opposition could be your finances. The opposition could be your occupation. The op your opposition could be, you know, the giants in the land, a relational difficulty. Your opposition could be large fortified cities and you don't have any. <laughs> but many times your opposition is you. You go on Facebook and you're like, well, why do they have more likes than I do? Why does she have more likes than I do? Why does he have more likes than I do? I don't understand it. People just don't like me. I'm a grasshopper. People don't like me. Why is it that people don't like me? Ah, people don't like me. Why is it that people don't seem to like me? I'm so worried about why people don't like me. Can I tell you something? Who cares? Do any of those people pay your bills? Do any of those people move the bar in any area of your life? Absolutely not. You need to live by the premise of this, that I will not allow the opposition to have permission to influence my life. I will not allow the opposition to have permission to influence my life. You see, that's what the people of Israel did. They allowed what they saw to influence whether or not they were going to walk into what God had already provided for them. And therefore, their destiny was deferred because of what they saw, because of what they believed about themselves. And they thought the enemy must think the same thing about us. They allowed their lives to be influenced. They gave permission to the opposition to influence them. Let me tell you something. If you come to my house and I know you, you can come all up in my house. My house will become your home. Make yourself at home. Go where you want. Do what you want. It's, it, act like it's yours. But if I don't know you, you come knocking on my door, you're banging on my door, you're going to let me in and I don't know you, you're a stranger. Mm. You're the opposition. Huh. You think you're going to come in and you begin to push your way in, there's going to be a problem. I mean, I, I, I might preach Jesus, but I'll help you meet Jesus. I'm just saying there's going to be a problem. The point that I am trying to make is some of you have allowed the enemy and the opposition 
to get all up in your house. All up in your house. And therefore, the enemy has distracted you and you're focused upon your condition rather than focusing upon his mission. Mm. And so now you're looking at what's in the blank, you know, and you're so, you're so consumed with what's wrong with your relationship and what's lacking in your relationship that you've forgotten the truth that you are an ambassador, an emissary in your relationship. You're so focused of what's missing in your finances that you've forgotten the truth that, that, that you have a mission of being a tither if you call yourself a Christ follower. We're so focused on our differences in culture today. What a president tweets, whether they should kneel in the anthem, whether we should take this statue down, leave that statue up, all of the, ra the racial, systemic racial issues that are happening. Can I tell you something? How can we drop all of our differences if we do not become an ambassador of Christ so that people will see the love of Christ in us, so that people will be reconciled to the graciousness of God some of you need to realize God didn't create you for the status quo that's in your life. Rather than God creating you for the status quo, God created you for another O, an O called overflow. Good God Almighty. His grace is more than enough. His mercies are new every single morning. Did y'all like how I got that other O in there? Overflow. You see, sometimes I think that we're so focused on what's in the blank that, that, that we live in the undertow rather than the overflow. And we wonder why we're drowning in life. David wrote about it in the 23rd Psalm. He said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I, I will not fear. He said, because I know God is with me. His rod and his staff, they, they comfort me. And he says in he causes me to lie down beside quiet waters when I'm tired. How many of you know when waters are run, running over rocks, it just makes this beautiful noise that's so tranquil? The Bible says that he restoreth my soul. The Bible says when the enemy thinks that he has cut you off, that God will prepare a table for you in the presence of your enemy so that your enemy realizes that your sustenance does not come from anything they control, but rather it comes from the resources of heaven because I am an ambassador. Good Lord and mercy. And then he says something. He says, and my cup overflows because surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Some of you need to drop what's in the blank and replace it with you are an ambassador. Drop what's in the blank that is not of God and replace it with I am a child of God. I am an overcomer. I am more than a conqueror. I am a holy nation, a special possession of God. Can I get somebody to get up on their feet and begin to give God praise? up in this place. Drop what's in the blank. Somebody say, do the drop. Stay on your feet for a minute. Hold on a second. Because in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, in the message translation, Christy, it said that our responsibility is to help men and women drop their differences so that they can be reconciled to God. Hold on. Week one of the series, every major point began with the letter D. Diet, go on a diet. Decide, declare. The second week, it was all R's. Resist, replace, remember. Last week, it was all P's. Preach, practice, pray. So we were missing a letter until today. And that letter is O. Hold on a second. Drop. Look at your neighbor and say, drop. Drop. You got to drop what's in the blank that was not ordained of God so that you can walk into the destiny that God has for you so that people will not see their differences anymore, but rather they'll see the beauty of who Jesus is because you are an ambassador bringing heaven's resources to earth so that people will be reconciled to a loving God. Lord have mercy. Drop. Drop. Everybody say drop. Drop. 